very proud of this report. This is a foundational report and it really shows and lays out a roadmap for re reform. Uh, it was a two-year inquiry, nearly 1,500 submissions, and I think the findings in this report reflect the evidence that we heard from the experts and the submissions that we heard from uh, Victorians. Over nearly 1,500 Victorians sent in a submission on interview use of cannabis. Now that is substantial, and the overwhelming support to the majority of them supported law reform, supported a change. And this is not about making cannabis available. It's readily available. The committee heard that over a third of Victorians have used cannabis, and about 30% of young people regularly use cannabis. So this is not about whether cannabis should be used or not, it's being used. It's about how we can reduce the harm that the cannabis use can cause. And I think this report lays out recommendations for how we can reduce harm, but also discusses and looks at overseas models and models of reform that may work for Victoria, where we could have a regulated market or we could decriminalise the use and possession. Look, I, I think there's, there's been some media about um, the deliberations of this report. I think my position on cannabis and cannabis law is well known. Um, but, you know, the, this is a committee process and the recommendations, you know, call for an investigation. I would have liked to have seen some of that wording a little bit stronger. But, I, you know, respect, respect the views of, of the majority of the committee. Was this inquiry not already an investigation? <laughs> I would say that we have that this inquiry is an investigation, and and I would really commend the report, and I would would encourage the government to look at the findings, to look at what we found, to look at the evidence that we received. Now, certainly, the police had a different view, uh, but. That we don't, the police should not be directing government policy. It should be the other way around. Now, police spend millions and millions of dollars uh, enforcing our current uh, criminalisation of cannabis. And organised crime makes millions and millions of dollars from those laws. Does the police have a um, too big an influence over Victorian government? I think I, I, I am I have got a, a, a growing concern of, about the influence that police can have on policy. Police will tell you that they're not here to, to make policy, they're here to enforce legislation. Yet time and time again their voice seems to be coming louder and more prominent in um, in government policy and certainly when we're looking at reforms, especially around drugs, and whether that's pill testing or cannabis decriminalisation. Fiona, is this report just keeping the can down the road? Look, this, I think this report's a lot more than that. This report actually <coughs> really quantifies the use of cannabis in Victoria. I don't think we've seen this information in one place. It looks at who uses cannabis, how they use it, where it's used. Uh, it looks at the laws in details. It looks at the impact of those laws. It looks at the health consequences of cannabis. So, no, this, this is a really important report and it will be um, a foundation block for future reform. Now, certainly, you know, we didn't get a unanimous call to, to introduce a regulated cannabis industry in Victoria, but this is a start and this shows how that could work. You've mentioned models overseas. What sort of model do you think would work in Victoria? What we found is that, you know, when you're looking at um, the the perspective of of drug laws, and you look at harm reduction, the criminalisation 
of cannabis causes harm in itself. The under-regulation, the laissez-faire approach that you might see in some of the states in America also causes harm. So it's finding that sweet spot in the middle. And that could be around a very regulated system of social clubs or a very controlled, regulated market where advertising was strictly uh, controlled, where the location of, of these of outlets was strictly controlled, who it was sold to was strictly controlled, what was sold was strictly controlled. So there, yeah, there are ways to do it, and this report certainly goes into some of those um, yeah, some of those pathways. How, realistically, how receptive do you think the government is to legalizing cannabis, and how likely do you think it is? Um, Law reforming cannabis is inevitable. It will happen. I don't know when, but it will happen. We're seeing this happen around the world. We are seeing that prohibition of cannabis has not reduced the number of people using cannabis. It has not reduced the availability of cannabis. So we can keep doing that, but it's not working. And it's creating far more harm than what it's preventing. So it is inevitable. I don't know when. I know that myself and I know many other people in this chamber uh, support law reform and we will keep advocating for sensible laws to be introduced to treat cannabis use like it should be, as a health issue, not a criminal one. Did you expect more from the government that they might be a bit more ambitious on this? They kind of were in favour of you starting the inquiry two years ago and they've been involved all along the way. Look, I, I had been hopeful that we would have seen a uh, yes, probably a slightly more positive uh, a positive um, recommendations. Uh, this, the, the, you know, the Andrews government says it's one of the most progressive governments in Australia. So let's hope that they put their money where their mouth is and we see them be progressive in drug law reform. Are you surprised when the government? Look, I can't. I can't say I was surprised. Uh, I was. I think I was slightly disappointed. But it wasn't just the government members on the committee that wanted to see, uh, you know, a, 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 mar a far more modest set of recommendations. It was other members from other parties. It was coalition members. It was independent members um, from the crossbench who also agreed with that position. Um, a, a position that I didn't agree with. Did they renege on any deals that you've done to get their broad support? No, there was no, no, there was no deals done on this. Um, this was a very straightforward report. It was a very straightforward forward inquiry. It was a very good inquiry. Uh, but I do think that during this time when we hear government, set, government officials and government members say, listen to the experts, listen to the experts, uh, we should be listening to the experts and, the, and their voices are clearly articulated in this report. Are you involved still in some important negotiations with the government to get around state emergencies laws? Is this going to affect your kind of goodwill or how you approach that? Yep. I, I, don't, I don't horse trade in this house. I, I do what is right and no, this will not affect how I move forward with, um, with conversations and negotiations around future pandemic legislation. A lot of the arguments for legalising cannabis could apply to other substances. Do you think this feeds into the wider argument for, for legalising drugs? I, we, we operate under a model of harm reduction and harm minimisation. So we know that criminalising drug use uh, prevents people from seeking treatment prevents people from getting adequate health and education on these issues. So yes, I think I would say that we need to look at how we treat all drug use. We know that if we actually provide good education, we reduce the stigma attached to drug use, we can greatly assist people who have problematic drug use. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.